When the fall TV season launched last year, we were introduced to a new breed of sitcom character. Will, Craig, and Kenny, three best friends who have completely forgotten what it means to be a man. He's a man's man, but lately he's realizing what happened to men. He's not in a man's world anymore. This is the story of three guys. Three guys who make fatherhood fun. Oh, baby, it's our anniversary times. Look, honey, I, I, uh... you know what? I get it. That was the deal we made, right? It's a woman's world. <laughs> he just has to live in it. You know the character, the lost man, out of work or earning less than his wife, outpaced and outshined by his female contemporaries. A couple of years ago, TV producers started coming to pitch meetings armed with an article from The Atlantic magazine called The End of Men. It was written by senior editor Hannah Rosen. They used it to show that this type of man could be found all over America and was ripe for sitcom satire. It was 2010. Millions of men had lost their jobs in the recession, and women made up the majority of the workforce. Not only that, but they were graduating from colleges and universities in greater numbers. Rosen's article made the case that men were failing to adapt to the new economy, an economy better suited for women. The article made waves far beyond TV and is the basis for a new book called The End of Men and the Rise of Women. We reached Hannah Rosen in Washington, D.C. Hello, Hannah. Hello. What did you think when you heard that TV producers were using your article to fuel their pitches? I thought that my imagination is not nearly developed enough and that I wish I had thought of it myself. I mean, who would have known that you could write a story which you think of as, you know, a very brainy uh, take on the economy and American relationships at this moment, and then somebody has the creativity to turn it into not one, but six different sitcoms, uh, a couple of which actually got made. So it was a great moment to think that you had that kind of influence on the culture, even though it really had nothing to do with you. But let's let's look at this archetype that they were interested in. The, the idea idea really is that men have lost their sense of what it is to be a man. So briefly, can you tell me what did it mean to be a man in the time before this? Well, I just want to lay a little bit of the groundwork in the economic argument. So it starts with an economy that's shifting rapidly. It's it's shedding, you know, its manufacturing era. It's moving into a new creative economy, service economy era. And those kinds of jobs tend to play up to the natural strengths of women. And so men who have been living in a certain way for so many years have a hard time basically readjusting. That's the foundation of what's happening. I think if you're used to defining, for example, breadwinner has been the central part of our uh, definition of what a man does. It's not the only definition, but it's something that we've taken for granted for many, many years. So if you're moving into an era where men are not necessarily, certainly not the sole breadwinners in America, and increasingly not the main breadwinners in America, then you realize that you have to really rethink what does it mean to be the head of the household absent being the breadwinner. Well, and some men are redefining that, but but you know, being a breadwinner or, or being able to rethink the way that, that you made your living when, when your job changed, are you saying that those were all the things that helped men succeed and that now men are not succeeding because they don't have those things? Yes, I think they've been defined in a pretty specific way over the better part of thousands of years, and that way that they've been defining themselves no longer holds true. So it takes a while before we figure out what the new way is. And I think part of, since you mentioned pop culture, we are only just now having a stay-at-home dad on TV who's not a complete idiot, you know, fumbling all the time, a, you know, a domestic moron, and who's still, like, sexy and lovable to his wife. And so we are only recently starting to get characters that men can say, oh, look, there are slightly alternative models uh, and ways of being as a man which are becoming acceptable in America. But look at where we are in the global economy at this point in, in the 21st century, possibly, maybe, hopefully emerging from a, an enormous recession. And the, the, the Obama campaign was fond of pointing out this week that, that Osama bin Laden is dead. General Motors is, is alive. Manufacturing jobs are coming back. Does, doesn't this mean that a lot of men who were out of work and who were having a concurrent identity crisis are now heading back to the job and maybe gaining back a sense of themselves. In a different way than before. So the manufacturing economy is not likely to ever play as large or central a role in either our economy or our imagination as it once did. Yes. So even when you talk to people about what manufacturing jobs are coming back, they're jobs that require you to retrain and get a new set of skills. It's sort of high-skilled manufacturing that's coming back. The key is a certain flexibility and ability to retrain yourself to be ready. And that's something that men are lagging at or having a hard time sort of catching up to. That's not to say 
say that they won't because I think they will. I just think at this moment in time, we have all this upheaval and we are not quite sure where it's going to land. But uh, but we, we, we do kind of know that men are having a hard time sort of catching up to the changes. Okay, but then you are saying that the downward trajectory of men is not permanent. I don't think the downward tra- – I mean, I like to think of it as, you know, the queen is dead, long live the queen. Like when you think of the end of men, in a sense, it's the new beginning of men. I mean, that <laughs> sounds corny when I say it that way. I've never quite used that phrase before. Um, but um, but it's but it's a way of rethinking what's acceptable, what our social expectations are for men. Because in the course of researching this book, one thing that surprised me was that the room for men to maneuver in our culture is much narrower than the room for women. women Women have been able to sort of remake themselves in the public sphere so many times over the course of the century. And men men had put themselves and we have put them in a fairly narrow space. So in some ways, I welcome the changes that are about to come. Mm-hmm. It's not a disaster for men. It could be a new beginning. I can't yeah. believe I said that again. But <laughs> I, I, yes. I appreciate that. You do. I think it's very, it <laughs> illustrates your point. You have a recurring idea in the book, the plastic woman, the cardboard man. And that illustrates women have always been better at adapting to the new world and men have been more rigid and more inflexible. But haven't men adapted to huge social change in, in, in the last four decades from feminism to civil rights, for example? A little bit. They've adapted a little bit. I mean, if they, you know, sure, men don't do absolutely nothing. I mean, if you think of something as simple as fatherhood, you know, a generation earlier of fathers were very different than my husband is, and I think than young fathers are today. You know, it's not really that socially acceptable to be the kind of dad who's really completely uninvolved in your child's life, Mm -hmm. you know, who comes and pats them on the head, who barely knows any of the teachers' names. Like, things have changed, you know, fatherhood has changed, men's support of women have changed. But I think in terms of what the men themselves, do you know people are still pretty uncomfortable with like the man staying home and taking care of the children that doesn't entirely sit well with people quite yet critics have said that you're you're perpetuating stereotypes that are kind of narrow that you know, the man in stasis or the, the man who's befuddled by change and, and the the super adaptive woman and and that, that 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 these stereotypes contribute to the identity crisis that, that some people are experiencing right now how do you respond to that yeah, I mean, people have also told me, you know, I don't want to read your book on the subway because the men are going <laughs> to, they're going to hate me. They see a title called The End of Men. Yeah, but they won't know my what to do own, about it. They'll just. They, <laughs> well, my own son is really irritated. My nine year old son, he doesn't like the title of the book because he thinks it's bullying too. I definitely see that point of view. I can only repeat, I don't think there's anything inherent, and I'm very careful to point this out, inherent in men or inherent in women that makes this moment their permanent state of existence. Right. And in fact, my conclusion conclusion is entirely about that. I talk about how some of the characters who I introduced at the start of the book and some of the latest research is showing men starting to pick mm-hmm, up the signals, mm-hmm. pick up the message and move across the continuum. And I think that's the really hopeful part. And even though women are surging forward, they still have very few positions at the top in the corporate world. Why do you think that is? That's absolutely true. Um, Partly that's because it just takes a lot of time, like the world doesn't flip around Mm -hmm. uh, overnight. It hasn't been that long that these changes have been happening. And so you can't expect women to sort of immediately take over at the top. And partly I think it's because in this transition moment, we are still uncomfortable with women in positions of power. It does still violate our sense of what a woman should be, how maternal she should be, and how she should behave. So you have scores of psychological studies, which I cite in the book, which show that, you know, present a subject with a vision of a woman, say, like negotiating pretty hard for herself, Mm -hmm. you know, give a man that same exact script and people will praise the man and also think he's a cool guy and people will not praise the woman, think she's sort of, you know, unpleasant and also not give her the raise. So we are definitely not over that hurdle of, you know, women in power. That's still something we are not totally comfortable with. In large part, we've been talking about the middle and the upper middle class. Yes. How how do you think this is playing out in the lower income brackets? Absolutely severely. Uh, if you look at the African American community has been a functional matriarchy. The poorer African-American community has been a functional matriarchy for quite a while now, since African-American urban men lost manufacturing jobs and kind of disappeared from the social fabric of life largely and created a matriarchy. I think that's what we're seeing sort of replicated up the socioeconomic ladder. So when I when I talk about this and some of the characters in my book are women who are newly finding themselves in a situation where the men around them they can't depend on mm-hmm. and so that they have to hustle 
hustle and and piece it together um, to some level of kind of independence and freedom and, and, a, and a great level of hardship and struggle. So I think the lower you move down the class ladder, the more blatant this phenomenon is. So you dedicated this book to your son, Jacob, with apologies for the title. Uh, how has what you learned changed the way that you raise your two sons? It has changed it a lot. I will say that you know, I wrote with apologies for the title because he writes a note on my attic door where I was writing the book every day and says, like, you bully. How could you write this book? That was, you know, <laughs> it was that's like an explicit conversation we have in our household every other day. OK, so with my son, I feel like I have three choices and two of them are not that great. <laughs> so one of my choices is to really try hard to change him. This is like free to be in you and me, like give William a doll, like try and be, make him really feminine and sensitive. Mm-hmm. As a parent, I actually think that's kind of an impossible task, right? We are we are presented with these beings that kind of are who they are, and you can help them navigate the world, you know, within their own skin. The second choice is to ask the schools to change, which there is some movement for and which a lot of parents do do, which is to say, give my son extra time, give him extra help, let him walk around the classroom, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not that comfortable doing that either because I think schools are what they are. So the compromise I've struck is that I try and cultivate what I refer to as his inner secretary, um, <laughs> because you know, one one mom once told me, you know, given so much that school demands, it, it looks like we become our son's secretaries, and I really don't want to be my son's secretary. <laughs> I don't think that's the way to go through life. So I want to teach him as best he can to learn the skills for himself. So actually, what I literally do, if you really want to know, is I put up a chart on the wall, and it tells him everything he has to do in the morning. You know, down to like, you know, tie your shoes, put your homework in your bag, get your lunch, and I. I'm trying to get him to internalize that list. And if he forgets one of those things, I try my best not to harangue him. He just is not going to have lunch that day. And, you know, he's going to have to borrow lunch from a friend. And maybe that's mean, but it's the only way I can think of to sort of drill it into his head that this is a list that he's going to have to internalize because I'm not going to be there his whole life, right? And I don't want his wife to be haranguing him every morning either telling him what he has to do. So the best I can to take him, meet him where he is, and give him the tools to be able to meet the world where he is is, that's that's my goal as a parent. I love it. Hannah Rosen, great to meet you. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you so much.